awakening to universal knowledge and consciousness through uplifting interviews and soul-stirring conversations to help you realize the divine power, force, and energy inside of you, your Sacred Valley. Expand your mind and free your spirit with Sacred Valley Podcast. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Sacred Valley Podcast. I'm Tara Crete, your host, and I want to introduce everyone to Miss Kate Montana. Kate, how are you? Welcome to Sacred Valley. Thank you so much, Tara. It's great to be here. Yeah, it's, it's really great. I know we've been trying to do this for a couple of months now. Kate, yeah. I'm going to do something a little different. Normally, I do like a little intro, mm -hmm. um, but what I, what I want to do, and you have to, hold, I'm going to go right to your website, okay? And I'm going to read your about because I just love it. And I don't think I could do, usually I like to go to people's websites or read a blog about them. Then I put my own words to it, but I want to read yours verbatim okay. because I love it so much. So let me see, let me, let me know what I can't see it when my, this happens. It's actually in the process of, ah, oh, she's already changed it. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. So let me read this. This is off of katemontana.com. Okay. Um, from a young age, I wanted answers, real answers about life, God, and who and what I am, not fabrications and belief systems from other times and other people. Although I didn't really know what the word meant, I wanted freedom. Six decades of good but hard living and relentless searching later, I had answers that not only made sense, I had experience that allowed the real me to be revealed. Kate Montana has done a lot of stuff, raised and trained horses, traveled and lived in many different countries, worked in network television, and then served as a journalist. She's done plant medicine with shamans in the Amazon jungles. And on the Altiplano of the Andes, she's meditated in ashrams, lived alone in isolated cabins in the wilderness, written books, and helped others write theirs. But that's just the story. It's not who she really is at all. <laughs> I love that. It's almost like kind of reading like a, a, a Japanese cone. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Fascinating. I you're a neat lady, Kate. You are a neat lady. And I'm so happy that you're here. Thank you. Well, it's so interesting because I just, with my new book coming out, um, Cracking the Matrix, I, I just asked my, I just sent new about me website copy because I looked at this, you know, how you write something like three years ago and you reread it all of a sudden. You oh, go, yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> I'm not that person anymore. I got to change that. Exactly. Yeah, I totally understand that. So yeah, so you wrote another book. Um, we're going to revisit your website here before we, we finish up because you've written many books. This one is called Cracking the Matrix, 14 Keys to Individual and Global Freedom. So um, let's talk about it because in this you explore the nature of what you call a highly destructive parasitic influence. I was calling it evil mm -hmm. and we were having a conversation backstage. Let's, let's get into that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I used the word evil in the book and when I started off this adventure investigating this degrading, de downgrading, um, uh, diminishing influence on humanity. Um, I use the word evil because that's just what came to mind. Actually, what triggered me was the whole um, COVID event when 2020 happened and I watched the world fall into fear and insanity and division and conflict. And I was like, Oh my God. And the reason I changed my about me <laughs> story on my website is because I wanted to, because up until COVID, up until 2020, I was a very spiritual person and, you know, 40 years of meditation and, uh, you know, and enlightenment experiences. And I'm writing about higher consciousness and transformational experiences. And, and, 2020 hit me between the eyes because I watched the world around me dissolve and I could find bliss easily on my Zazen pillow with my eyes closed every morning. But what good did that do when I opened my eyes? Mm -hmm. And what good did that do the world? Well, you know, there are lots of spiritual answers to what that, you know, what that does for the world. Oh, you're sitting in bliss on your Zazen pillow and you're percolating that bliss through the field and everybody is uplifted because of that. So it was like I realized that I had this sanitized, spiritualized, disengaged, disembodied approach to living. And that was a real wake up call, Tara. And so I looked around at the world and I went, what the hell is happening? Why are we going here? Why after, you know, 2,500 years ago, Buddha, you know, introduces the whole thing about enlightenment. And 2,000 years ago, Jesus brings the teaching of love 
and community and togetherness and connectedness. Mm -hmm. And we're still wandering around like, like slabs of, you know, meat asleep, thinking we're only slabs of meat and that we've got to do X, Y, Z to get to heaven or to become enlightened or to be a better person or to self-help. We have, we're, we're so divorced from our true nature, which is pure love. I so agree with that, Kate, but what, you know, and so you feel like COVID kind of opened your eyes to that realization of it because there, it was so blatant. There was so much division. We are in a, I mean, in my opinion, seemingly worse place than we were before we started. I mean, relationships have shattered. People are angry. Uh, we're fighting with each other instead of fighting against the parasitic influence that you're talking about. So I don't know. There's so many ways we can go. But I guess I want to talk about this in, in the form of like how you, you wrote this book and why you wrote this book. So um, I do call it evil and, and I don't care. I guess, you know, you're using a different word because I never knew this parasitic influence. I didn't really think it, it was as per, um, permeating as it is. Like that, that was my realization in COVID. That was one of my realizations. Right. COVID. Right. So why do you call it a parasitic influence versus evil? Evil is a good word. But it's the, it's the, this is an astral influence. So, okay, I got to just backtrack really quick. So 2020 happens, I go, oh my God, I've got to open my eyes and see what's going on and understand why this is going on. So I was like, there's, there's this nasty, gnarly, evil influence on the planet. And so I started to investigate what we call evil. And it was really shocking, Tara, because I discovered that there, every culture going back thousands of years, every culture on every continent has a name for this presence and has a description. The Greeks called it the archons, the evil ones with insidious intent. Um, of course, we call it in Christian, um, you know, Beelzebub, the devil. Um, in Islam, it's Ashaitan. To the Hawaiian kahunas, it's Eepa. To the Iroquois nation, it's Windingo. Um, other Native American tribes call it Wetiko. Yeah. What it is, is astral, invisible, mental, emotional influence, presence, intelligence that is invisible to the, to the physical, to the physical realm. But its presence is insidious, ongoing, powerful, and it, it's like, I've traced this presence back about 30,000 years. So that's as far as I've been able to track it through various research means. And um, so then the, the, the question becomes, well, what is this presence doing here and what's its agenda? And fundamentally what I've understood is its agenda is to be able to embody. It's a, it's a non-physical force. It is an anti-life force. It has seen our light, our pure love, and, it, and our physical existence expressing and embodying, and it wants it. It doesn't understand love. It's not interested in love. It's an anti-love, anti-life, in astral presence intelligence, but it wants what we've got because that's its nature is to want and to take over and to subsume and then move on. And so I was, let, let me just ask that I totally agree with what you're saying. It makes, you know, it, it brings some sense to the nonsensical stuff that we've been experiencing these last few years. Yes. That it, it feels like there is a force. It feels like, and you know, we want to equate it. We want to um, point at a certain group of people, you know, whoever's running this planet, but you're talking about this being an energy mm -hmm. that an intelligence. It, and it, it permeates every area of our life, our spirituality, mm -hmm. our religion, Mm -hmm. uh, our thoughts are every day, and it seems to be getting stronger. Do you think that's the case? Oh, absolutely. Well, what's interesting is that's a yes and a no. Um, I'm, I, I, I'm really seeing that because th this presence has been hidden for 30,000 years, okay, working behind the scenes, but now it's really up. And we can, and even, even the, the uninitiated on um, Joe Blow on the street can go. I think something's wrong. I think some, there, there's something here that I'm not seeing. So it's, it's, I think it's at the end of its last gasp. It's got to make this push now because if it doesn't make this push now and somehow come into final control of humanity, it's out. So it's, 
This is the make or break wake up call time. And we are in serious breakdown, which is also serious breakthrough. I agree. Um, you know, I, I think you and I, we've, we talked about it backstage. We have a lot in common and I have a feeling we're going to agree on this too. I do think that where a lot of people will say, God, the world is just going to shit. You know, this world mm -hmm. is, and, and I'm like, well, no, it's, it's always been this way. <laughs> They're just showing us. Right? Just the veil is being lifted. Nothing's changed. It seems like it's getting worse, but we're waking up and we need to dismantle it. It needs to be removed and broken down before we can build anew. That's my positive stance on all of this. Absolutely. Which takes me back to something you said earlier, you know, to how to fight this. And, and it's like, I finally come to the place where it's like, let it all go. Let the world, which was built on rotten foundations mm -hmm. to begin with, um, a divisive, separative consciousness to begin with, um, let it fall, which is easy to say, but hard to watch. And, and then how do you navigate those waters? But at the same time, one of the things that I've realized that's so important, Tara, is that it's not about fighting anything because this force has no power. Mm. It, it can't pick up a pen. Right. Hello. Now, so this has it's been its agenda of how it's woven into our lives and our control. It's gotten in our heads. Mm -hmm. It's convinced us that we are what it is, that we are evil, right. that we are corrupt, that we are violent, that we are corrosive, that we are divisive mm -hmm. and aggressive. So we've bought it. So now the question, so now we've got this mindset that has been developed for thousands of years. Um, I'm gonna give you an example of how this insidious mental, emotional, astral influence influences us and then corrodes and degrades our consciousness to bring it down to its level Please do. so that it can finally have a frequency specific, you know, we're up here, pure love, and it's down here frequency wise. So to be yeah. able to use these bodies and have this experience that it lusts after, it's got to bring us down. It can't come up. It doesn't know love. No. It does not nothing. So it's got to bring us down to that divisive, corrosive, violent level. So um, <laughs> when I was researching, one of the things that fascinated me and that I've long felt was one of the most insidious, corrosive th thoughts implanted into humanity is the idea of original sin. So where did original sin come from? The is this going to be a blasphemous statement? I have a feeling some people might be like, oh, my God, what is this woman saying? No, this is going to be a very enlightening. Um, okay, perfect. Um. So, of course, original sin is if I'm born into a body, I'm born corrupt. I'm born into sin. I'm born naturally into evil tendencies, into aggression, into violence, into all of those things. That's the story about original sin. So where did the story come from? Well, back in around 350, 360 AD, Augustine of Hippo, better known nowadays as St. Augustine, introduced the idea of original sin into the Christian creed. Now, where did Augustine get it? Well, as it turns out, growing up, his mom was a Christian and Augustine's dad was a pagan. And he took after his father and was a basically a sexual reprobate, a drunk, and uh, just a ne'er-do-well to the despair of his Christian mom. So anyway, at one point in his late 20s, Augustine runs across a religious teaching called Manichaeism, which was developed by uh, a, the prophet of Babylon, Mani, back in about 250, in four, 250 AD, 100, about 100 years before. And Manichaeism's whole foundation is based on the belief of original sin, that the body is corrupt and that all evil tendencies and all the explanations for all our inner demons and shadows, etc., is because of the body. So Augustine comes along, sees that and goes, whoa, that explains why I've been such a shithead all my life and, and, you know, and done all these terrible things and driven my mother to distraction. And he converts to Monarchaism and then to Christianity. And then he brought and introduced at the Synod of Hippo in three something AD, 
um, the whole concept of original sin, and it was incorporated into the whole Christian mm. theology. So the point is, where did Mani come up with the idea of original sin? Well, it turns out that Mani heard a voice. There was a disembodied presence that whispered in his ear, and he called it his other self. And it whispered in his ear that, it, that the body was sinful and corrupt and that this was the reason that we were the way we were and that we had to strive beyond and get out of the body and become better and that we were worthless and shameful. And that's the story. And it came from a disembodied voice. Now, some people might say, oh, but it was an angel. And that's actually what Monty thought. Oh, it was an angel speaking to him. Was it? It could have been another personality for all we know. How about an archon? How about this? An, a, a parasitic influence? Yeah. It's an intelligence. Mm -hmm. It's mental and it feeds on emotional energy. So that the most, the most insidious, degrading, demeaning teaching I think that has ever been foisted on humanity came from a disembodied something wow. whispering in somebody's ear. I mean, you know, the little devil on one shoulder and the angel on the other. Yeah, I've heard of that. So that's the kind of, you know, and, and then we wonder, okay, so that happened uh, 1,500 years ago, okay? So for 1,500 years, we've got 100 generations of men and women in the West, in Christian, I mean, hot, dear, open, loving people wanting to be better, mm -hmm. human beings, and to approach God and godliness, and they've incorporated this, you know, so that they're filled with shame and despair and remorse and sexual guilt. And, and we wonder why a hundred generations of epigenetic influence of shame later, we've got generations filled with lack of self-esteem. Uh, that and I've never, you know, I've never been able to reconcile with that. I've never I mean, I grew up going to church when I was little. I would never, I don't think I've ever considered myself a Christian, but I was, you went to church, it was a big part of my life. I believe that there was a Jesus Christ that walked this planet, but what never sat well with me was my Catholic friends who really the ones that taught me about having this, you know, when you're just by being alive, we're sinful. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, geez, there's no really way to win this then. There's something, how do we, how do we come on top of this until, well, until we leave the, the body and we go to heaven, right? That's the, the concept. So it's, oh, yeah. it's never sat well with me. And I've never heard of this explanation. And I've never questioned, you know, where did that original thought come from? That's fascinating. Isn't it? Yeah. So when I say an evil influence, when I say a, a, an anti-life degrading, divisive influence. That's the kind of influence I'm talking about. And if you take that influence and realize that that's just one example out of 30,000 years. So it's been really shocking, Tara, because fundamentally, you know, you know, we all want transformation and the veils and the scales to drop from our eyes. And, and I always thought that when, when that transformative moment came, I would be, you know, at least in bliss and in a heavenly yeah. kingdom place. Maybe oh, like Maybe like a, a, some angel singing in the background or a bu yes. blast of light, yes. something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. But what I've, what I've come, <laughs> I live totally in a different reality now than I did two years ago. A completely I different reality. It. I am, and I mean literally, because everything I see around me in my society, it all now makes sense. That's what I said before. This, this, you're giving life um, and maybe even a name or description to the, the craziness that has taken over yeah. this planet and that we're seeing more rapidly. And I think like you, I think it's a good thing. And I, what I don't, uh, what I don't lavish in are people that are suffering. And this is where we have a real war going on. We have a real spiritual war, in my opinion. And mm -hmm. a lot of people are suffering, suffering. Some are losing their lives. So I, I don't relish in that. But I, I do get excited about what is coming. And I sure hope we get to live long enough to start seeing the, the band. I think we have a lot of shit to go through. I think we have a lot of crappy years ahead in some way. Yeah. But in your book, Kate, you, you talk about the first Part of it is, you know, you got to see what you're talking about, see the reality of this anti-life force. And I've never mm -hmm. heard that either. And I like that because that really encapsulates mm -hmm. what we're talking about. And then you say the second thing is to understand its agenda. Is its agenda to feed off of us solely or is there, are they feeding that to do something else with the energy? 
Well, number one, I have to say that I don't know everything and that I'm, you know, although I've considerably wiser now than I was two years ago, I don't have all the answers. Okay. Um, my understanding is that, and I've experienced these, I, I've experienced these entities myself, all, actually all of my life. Um, and especially when I started meditating and I cracked my Kundalini and all of my energy and psychic centers away, awakened, Holy Moses, I was attacked every night. Um, I was pulled out of my body by creatures and hurt and thrown into astral graveyards and beasts coming at me with claws and fangs and dripping blood. I mean, all of the most horrific fear-based stuff imaginable. Well, you know, when I started meditating, I was 30. I was, you know, a, a, a Madonna would have loved me. I was the total material girl. I was clueless. And, you know, and riddled with, with fears and, and doubts and unconscious crapola. And, you know, well, of course, I resonated to that lower level. So it had easy access. Uh -huh. when, as we rise in frequency and, you know, it falls away. And as I say, it doesn't have enough power to, to pick up a pen. Mm. So the, the trick is, is to convince us that we are it. And here's, here's the real kicker, Tara. And this, this changed everything for me. And I think it will change everything for everybody is when I turned and I finally stopped running away from looking at this influence, because who wants to look at evil? You know, religion has made it a charade and a character caricature, caricature, you know what, you know, caricature. caricature. <laughs> easy um, for me to say. <laughs> so easy for me to say. Um, so that we can dismiss it easily. You know, if I'm going to burn in hell for having premarital sex, it's like it, it, it makes evil nothing. It makes it almost laughable and it, it disappears it from view, which is the whole point. And then the whole spiritual new age agenda has been go to the light, get out of your body, get up there and out, mm -hmm. up and out, up and away. Don't look, don't look at the be positive. Don't look at the negative. Be positive. Don't see it. This is part of the agenda. You um, cannot you cannot transcend something you don't know exists or you will not allow it to exist. That makes a lot of sense as well. Um, there, there's a lot of things that are thrown out at us to distract us, I guess is what I'm hearing you say, yes. from looking at it, because it's almost like once you look at something, it is like turning a light on. You know, yeah. how, how many times have you, have you been frightened from a belt on your floor and you thought it was a snake? Or, you know, you hear your, your animal in the house thinking it's a robber, but it's really your animal. You know, we all, there's real fear and then there's perceived fear. But once you turn the light on, you realize, oh, it's just a belt. What was I afraid of? Yeah. You, know, you realize, you realize what it really truly is. Yeah. And, you know, and, and we've been assiduously trained in the spiritual community. To, you can't afford the luxury of a negative thought. Because, oh, my God, if I look at that, I'm going to manifest it into my life. So we are conditioned to ignore this. Yeah, perfect. Holy moly. It's and perfect. It's, and it's, them. Perfect. it's a perfect setup. And it's mm -hmm. all fear based. Because when we're in fear, we are controllable. And that's the whole gig. That's it right there. That's it in a nutshell. That's what I believe a lot of organized religion is based on. And I think religion is a wonderful path for people. I'm not. I'm not dissing it. I think it's a wonderful, if that's your path to God, but understand what it really is and why it was created. It was created so that they can control the people who were at that point out of control from what I understand it 3000 years ago. You know, all of these up looking, uh, wanting to be more, you know, if we really look at the fundamentals of human nature, we are beings of pure love and our essential nature is pure love. And our essential nature is to be good to to take care of one another and and so you know we have this naturally upstriving um focus that is that's the insidious part because it's up and out and away from our own if we embody pure if we are pure love we don't have to do anything except be what we already are but we've been schooled to try to constantly strive and, and go and do this and read that, and listen to this person and do that. And if you do this and 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 this, and this you'll get somewhere. But you're mm -hmm. all there. So it's again, it's this, it's this insidious influence that takes us away 
from our true power. Yes. Oh, holy moly. And so this beautiful natural influence of love is has been corrupted and it's not our fault. And when I finally turned around, Tara, and I opened my eyes and with a little bit of trepidation and fear, I will confess, turned and looked at this and researched it and understood what we're finally dealing with, what I've been dealing with all of my life. And I understand that I'm a being of pure love embodied in my body. Mm -hmm. And I looked at this force that can't even pick up a pen. And I went, Oh, that's not me. And when I realized that evil is not me, that violence is not me, that aggression and divisiveness is not me, that shameful acts is not me, that I have no reason to fear myself because I am pure love. What's to fear? It was like taking a dead gorilla off my back. That's really powerful. So is that what you mean, Kate, when you talk about this in your book? Um, like you, you, like step number four, learn how to break free of its age old spell is just knowing it enough, just recognizing it and realizing that there is this parasitic influence that we have on this planet, or is there more to it that people should delve into? I wonder. Oh, I think you've frozen on me, Kate. We are that we are the evil ones. And so, you know, you're going to have to go. You froze on me there for a second. So I missed that. After my yeah. question to you, if we should do more than just understand it and know it. So can you start over there, please? Thank you. Yeah, the understanding. Yes. But and then the, but the recognition that it's not me. I am not. Oh, I think we have a bad connection, unfortunately. Sorry about that. There you are. You're back. Stay. <laughs> stay, stay, stay. Is this the parasitic influence <laughs> that we're talking about? Dear to God, I mean, because it operates through Wi-Fi at high frequencies. Oh, there's sure. A, there's a technology behind this. this oh, I totally believe that. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, but the recognition that I'm not that, that I'm not this corrupt thing. That I'm not, sh that I have no reason to be filled with shame, that that's a program that's been put, poured down my throat. Whoa, then my power and my grace comes back. Then I've got an embodied place. It, it, it's so powerful because instead of out and run away and don't look at anything and try to do, the, I'm down and in. The exact opposite of what we've been trained down mm. and in, down and in, down and in. Embodied love. Boy, I'll tell you, it's the concept. I love the sound of it. You know, I'm in my fifties now, mm -hmm. so it's hard. It's, and I understand it and I get it and I love it and I want to adopt it. But you know, if I had learned this in kindergarten, if you teach this oh. to a kindergartner, imagine how different one's life would be. If it's just a knowingness, a belief system um, versus, you know, you've, you're taught from the day you were born that you're a sinner yeah. uh, or that you're not God and you're not close to God, you're not of God, or that you're broken and you have to go and find another spiritual guru or another book or something else that's going to, like, I, I see all of our pieces coming back is what you're talking about. Like when you yeah. drag a computer, like everything that's, starts to come back. That's a really good analogy, Tara. Yeah. Yeah. That's and it's, and it's, it's, it's an endless rabbit hole and it's designed to be an endless rabbit hole because I mm -hmm. keep coming back to how can you become what you already are? Right. You don't need to look anywhere. That's what I'm saying. But it's it's almost so simplistic, Kate, that it's like it's difficult to grasp. <laughs> yeah. Look, look at me. Look where I went. Look where you went. You know, you you spent how many years sitting on your cushion, um, and you were you were there with yourself, with your presence. You were you were were you trying to get away from something? Even then, do you think when we meditate, we're trying to run away, or are we trying to marinate in it? I, w I was totally on the enlightenment path. That was all I cared about. And, you know, and I, I know I've put in a good 30,000 hours on that pillow wow. and, um, and, and had a lot of amazing, I mean, true. I mean, the personality dropped for days on end and I was just in a, I can, the only word I can use is a, is a oneness with all and, and I'm an eternal being. And there, when I laughed ever thinking that I thought I was identified with being a, a fleshly human by the name of Kate Montana. So I've had all those experiences, but what the hell good is it if I can't embody it? That's right. 
<laughs> to know to know and to experience are two different things. Yeah, because there was always this this ground foundation that the body is something less. You know, we kind of pay lip service to Mother Earth and Gaia and and you know and the the feminine and all and we pay lip service to embodiment, but we don't know what the hell it even is because we haven't done it. We're so busy trying to be better and elsewhere and up there and out there. And it's just like, oh. so to finally, you know, my practice anymore is just to practice feeling the love in my body at a cellular level and being more and more in tune with my body because the body never lies. And the body is pure love. I mean, come on, we've all done enough quantum physics studies in the last 25 years to realize that this is, you know, the appearance of mm -hmm. physics. And the, 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 this is a body of love, and I'm a being of pure love, and it's all one and the same thing. It never, it never separated except up here. Yeah, that's so true. And uh, you know, I think I still find myself on that hamster wheel. I do. I think I still. But that's what I'm saying. I love, and I, I had another guest on, and he was the spell breaker, and he was saying very similar things as you, which I like this because I think it's starting to become a little bit more well-known that we are, we're enough as we are. And we just need to relax and know that and just live from that space rather than, you know, following our ego, um, looking for another teacher to go and learn from. We mm -hmm. are everything. But again, it almost sounds cliche, you know, cause I know that you talk about, you know, self-love and how elusive. Oh, I be. know. I know. You know, one of the keys in the book, Tara is, starting to listen to your intuition. Actually, the very first key is, is stop. Well, you know, we, we're on this, you know, the head's going here and the body's going here and we're running around and we're doing all this stuff. And it's like, and the first thing is stop, even if it's for 30 seconds, take a breath, come aware of your body and listen, what's going on? Where do I need to go from here? So what happened when I, I was writing the, the, the first key in the first at the end of the first chapter, and I was like sitting there at my computer going, first key, first key, my kingdom for a first key, <laughs> you know, you know, and my head's going like this. And I was like, stop, stop, stop. So I stopped and I did that. And I was like, oh, duh, that's the first key. <laughs> there it is. There it is. It'll bite you on the nose if you're not careful. <laughs> yeah. And so there's so much intelligence here. And there's so much, it, it, this is spirit. It knows. And it's our true guide through these tumultuous times. And it's, it's this, you know, we all know those moments of, of gut, brain, heart connection. And the intuition bites deep and we just know. That's the space I'm talking about, relying on more and more instead of external answers. And that's just, that's the first step. I think the steps you cover are great. And um, I want people to, so can they buy your book from your website? Can they buy it from Amazon? I'm going to go back to your website here real quick. It comes out next week. It's coming out next week? Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So where will they be able to buy it? Um, I'm Amazon. It'll be on Amazon. Okay. Yeah. So let's go to your books because you've got a lot of them. This is Cracking the Matrix, the one that's coming out, 14 Keys to Individual and Global Freedom. This is what we've been talking about, but it's just your your latest. How long does it take you to write a book? This one I start. it's been a year since I started Cracking the Matrix. And this is the first book I've self-published. All my other books have been published by. Oh, great. fantastic. Congratulations. And I wish you luck with that. Uh, this, experience. <laughs> I can imagine. I can only imagine. So well, you've got I, another one here. The ego is not the enemy. This is something I'm interested in. I've done a lot of ego work. Yeah. Oh, then you'd like the E word, ego and light. I would. I would. Yeah. You'd like um, that. This one also sounds very interesting. Unearthing Venus, my search for the woman within. You've got some really great stuff here and it's a memoir. So yeah. um, that was when I woke up and realized I was living like a guy uh, that I'd been <laughs> assiduously programmed to be a guy. No you kidding. Know? As a woman. I mean, and, and I had no earthly idea what the nature of the feminine was. And so, yeah. so we're fragmented, we're fractured, we're programmed, we're yes. deluded. We've got this insidious, you know, the, I think Tara, the, the thing that has shocked me the most is the 
absolute onslaught of the programming and the the influence that you know god it's like being a fish in freaking water you don't know about it you don't see it right and yeah. you know yeah, you know, we were talking about influence. You know, we've got religious influence. We've got the spirituality thing. We've got our polit our divisive politics. We have a pyramidal, hierarchical, economic work system that may is all about better than and competition and beat the other guy. Mm -hmm. and all mm -hmm. sorts of horrible stuff. And the, and isn't it a coincidence that we have been driven like cattle down a chute? That this is where we're at. That this is our society. That this is our reality it really is I'm, I'm getting tired kate yeah yeah <laughs> is anyone else feeling tired god I'm feeling tired um yeah, yeah. so you know and i'm and not that old i'm not too i'm not so old that i'm not, i shouldn't be this tired i think everybody's tired tara it's yeah. enough and one last thing i'm going to say about influence god i ran across this statistic you know, in the United States, Americans watch a cumulative 250 billion hours of television a year. Wow. Again, that's by design. That's staggering. That's staggering. So what's staggering. the message of media? You are dysfunctional. You sexual debauchery, um, uh, dysfunctional emotion, dysfunctional relationships, um, it, it's all about dysfunction and lowering, lowering, fear. lowering, and fear and device. Yeah. It's all violence, aggression, sex, and dysfunction, and drugs and alcohol. That's and so that cool. is a relentless push. And then, of course, we have advertising, which is like, good lord, the pharmaceutical companies are are, are owned by the, the all right, ABC, NBC, all of the all of the network, all of ninety percent of global media is owned by the same three asset management exactly. companies that own Moderna and Pfizer and all mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. So it's like, so we've got all of these commercial, you know, pushing the you're sick, you're dysfunctional, you've got IBS and can't get it up, and oh my god! So the messaging is. It is. We're being bombarded. We're being bombarded. We're tired. Yeah. And unless we have this other perspective that something else is going on and that this is all deliberate, then it's just this endless, confused swim of desperation going, oh my God, there's got to be a better way. So no wonder we want to go out to the light. Because we're not given an option to be here because this here we've been trained isn't the place to be. They We're, want us any place but there. Any place because this has been given this to us as the, problem, as the problem. This is not the problem. This is the solution. We really have been conditioned to believe that. And I think maybe even on a uh, you know a subconscious level, a lot of people may not even realize it. Their programming that has taken place over the years with television, uh, through religion, through spirituality, even, you know, the new age revolution. That's that was a there was a lot of stuff in there, like we're talking about now, that that wasn't true. And I was the same as you, you know, trying to be enlightened and going toward the light, and didn't want to be negative and doing, you know, manifestation and trying to trying to create oh. something that you wanted, right? That that was like a big thing. You're gonna love this. You and I both go back to Ramtha. So this, I'm gonna take you back to 1990. I'm in the arena at the ranch, Ramtha's teaching, and then he comes out with this line. Oh, and by the way, when you die, do not, whatever you do, go to the light. Right. And I sat there and I went, what? Oh, no. What you God's doing? in the light. My, my parents are in the light. My dog is in the light. Everybody goes to the light. What do you mean don't go to the light? And then he continued the conversation. He said, because it's a false light that's projected from this astral influence and their technology and it's it, it and you will be stripped of your memories you will your emotions will be stimulated your negative emotions will be stimulated and you will be drained and stripped of everything and then shunted back into another body completely clueless and to live in the washing machine of upset and despair and conflict and separation mm -hmm on planet earth in this programmed matrix, which is why I called the book cracking the matrix. It is a matrix. There are many yeah. matrices, but anyway, yeah. so, I, so I was like, and that was in 1990. And I was like, same. 
I read, I wasn't there, but I read, I read about it and heard about it. And ever, honestly, even to this day, I'm like, oh my okay, if I die today, don't go to the light. It's a trick. Yeah. Don't go to the light. So what are we supposed to do? <laughs> Hang a left and go to the void. Okay. okay. The, the Native Americans call the void the dark light. The dark light. Let's go to the dark. Mm -hmm. Go to the void. The All things potentially, nothing actually, but it's all things potentially. It is the bosom of creation. Well, as um, the lovely Persian poet said, Rumi, let darkness be my candle. I've always loved that. Oh, whoa. That gives yeah. me. I know. He has the most, he, there's so many lines of his poems that you'll read that will do that to you. Let wow. darkness be my candle. So that's actually a really great um, moniker, a little grit like saying to remember, Kate. I know. I'm writing it as down. We, as we cross over, right? That's an easy way. So that's wonderful. Thank you for making those two connections for me. Thank you. And thank you for giving me that quote. That's beautiful. Yeah. Because if there is any truth to what Ramtha taught us and what we know that if, the, if this is the, the case, then I want darkness to be my candle and to light the way. Well, you know, and it's so interesting because that was 23, that was 33 years ago for me that I was mm -hmm. given that teaching. Did I believe it then? Mm -hmm. I had all these years and decades of programming that told me that that was like, what? And so it really never sank in. And I had all these clues, including my own experiences with these astral entities. Mm hmm over and over and over, but it always happened in liminal spaces it, between waking and sleeping, in meditation, it, when in bed at night, out of body experiences. So that when I came back and I opened my eyes, it was like, well, that was really strange, but it was ephemeral. It was intangible. So, you know, I've, I've been steeping in this cracked matrix place. I've been steeping on this for 30 years. That's how programmed I was. Oh, I believe it. Yeah. So as I say, and, and then to get spit out the other side, turning around and looking at this and putting the pieces of the puzzle together, finally writing this book. Um, that's why I say I'm in a totally different reality. I believe you are. And, and I'm excited about that reality. And you might be in an entirely different one four years from now. We're going to have to talk about that as well. Because one thing we know for sure being on this planet it, it's always different. There's always something exciting going on. I believe we are in the most exciting times that maybe have ever existed uh, on this planet. I really do. And I would never miss it for the world. Um, you know, everyone go out and get Kate's book. It comes on the market next week, creating the matrix 14 keys to individual and global freedom. Kate, you have a, a matter of fact way of looking at the world. It's refreshing. It's comical. It's innocent <laughs> and it's ancient all at the same time. So, <laughs> I want to thank you for being on Sacred Valley, and I hope you come back soon. And I feel like we're soul sisters, so I so appreciate you being here. Totally. Thanks, Tara. Mwah. Aloha. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, please tune in again next time. Sacred Valley will join you probably in the next couple of days. Thanks for listening.